Hello, I'm Jan Newhart, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Welcome to First Five Now, a Freedom Forum conversation series that explores topical issues and features current newsmakers who are using the five freedoms of the First Amendment to guide their work. Our guest today is Jack Weinberg, whose act of civil disobedience 56 years ago helped launch the highly influential and revolutionary free speech movement. In October of 1964, Weinberg was arrested on the campus of the University of California, Berkeley, on charges of distributing civil rights movement advocacy information. Following his arrest, he sat in the back of a police car for 32 hours while thousands of students gathered to block the vehicle's movement. Weinberg went on to become one of the leaders of the ultimately successful Berkeley free speech movement, and his arrest and confinement marked the beginning of student activism nationwide. We present today's program during Free Speech Week, an annual event designed to raise public awareness of the importance of freedom of speech. If you're interested in learning more, visit us online at freedomforum.org backslash speech to explore this valuable freedom that allows Americans to express themselves freely. And now, please welcome our moderator, Jean Polisinski. Thank you, Jan. And to our audience, welcome to First Five Now. I'm Jean Polisinski, President and Chief Operating Officer of the Freedom Forum Institute and Senior Fellow for the First Amendment at the Freedom Forum. We're pleased to have as a guest today, free speech movement pioneer, Jack Weinberg. During Free Speech Week, a nonpartisan, non-ideological yearly event designed to raise public awareness of the importance of freedom of speech and a free press in our democracy. Before I introduce our guest, I want to acknowledge our Freedom Forum donors and thank them for the support which makes programs like this possible. As Jan mentioned, Jack Weinberg was in at the start of the Berkeley free speech movement. And for the rest of the 1960s, he continued as a Berkeley-based activist and a campaigner in support of the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement in Viet about Vietnam and the Black Liberation Movement. At the end of the decade, when he saw many of those movements beginning to fragment or fracture, uh, he concluded that one of the reasons was that the student and youth-based initiatives had been isolated from what most Americans uh, wanted in terms of social change and their experiences. And so along with others, he decided to change his circumstance. He moved to the Midwest, got a blue collar industrial job and became active in union and community issues. Living in Gary, Indiana, working in a steel mill. He learned of plans to build a nuclear power plant on the shores of Lake Michigan. He uh, organized and helped lead a successful multi-year effort that eventually I believe defeated the uh, effort to build that nuclear power plant based on a coalition of community groups, local unions, environmentalists in the counties around that area. And he became increasingly aware of, as he writes, uh, and concerned about serious environmental threats to human safety, health, and well-being. He lost his steel mill job in the late 1980s uh, in an economic downturn, so pursued an environmental career, joining Greenpeace as the international toxic campaigner for 10 years from 1990 to 2000. Um, and while working for Greenpeace, he organized an international group, the International Pollutants Elimination Network, IPEN, which had environmental and public health groups working together to protect the environment and human health. He left Greenpeace in 2000 and has continued as a senior advisor to IPEN, a network that has, has more than 600 participating organizations and a presence in well over 100 low and middle income countries. Jack, thank you for being with us. It's great to, uh, to meet you and to uh, have a chance to chat about uh, in a year, I guess, marked by COVID, but also by, from a First Amendment perspective, somewhat unparalleled in, in our lifetimes, use of petition and assembly, except for the free speech movement, you might say. Um, we're seeing in those movements the same goals that you had in the free speech movement in one sense. I know you you actually were active in civil rights work prior to the free speech movement. Um, how, how is it today? How does that resemble what you saw in the, in the early 60s and throughout the 60s? The free speech movement um, was actually 
of less than three months duration. It was a direct, um, it was a direct outcome of the civil rights movement. Um, I had been active on civil, uh, as a civil rights activist on campus, um, mainly mobilizing students to participate in civil rights protests uh, in and around the Bay Area. Um, it was a period of time when, um, very, very much like the period after um, George Floyd's um, death, um, this was after sort of the, uh, in, um, Birmingham, in, in Birmingham, Alabama, when young children started marching, and it was one of the first times um, that TV had matured to the point where they could put that on TV the same night, and there were police dogs attacking young civil rights, high school kids, uh, college kids, even some grammar school kids, they were marching day after day, and it sort of struck the whole country, and particularly young people. And after that, there were civil rights protests all over the country, um, uh, including in the Bay Area. The issues were different in the South and different in the Bay Area, but there was a big civil rights movement, and many, many students were becoming involved. And I was one of the um, organizers of mobilizing students for that purpose. At the beginning of the fall semester in 1964, the university um, issued a pronouncement um, that would ban um, all activity on the campus of advocacy. You know, that is you couldn't, you, know, you couldn't get people to sign a petition, raise money, advocate for a cause. Um, and what we did, couldn't put out flyers or posters saying join a demonstration. The issue, the, the issue was the university clamped down on students engaging in protest movements and organizing others to do that. And the free speech movement uh, was a response to that. And it was led initially by the civil rights activists who felt that they were under attack and were outraged at the University of California at Berkeley, a supposed institution of enlightenment, had come down on the wrong side of the issue of the day. Um, it, and it was, a, it was a three month, two and a half month fight. Um, interesting, but no time to go into the details now. Um, one of the most um, exciting campaigns of my long life that I've ever engaged in. And in the end, um, it was a complete victory. Students won the, it, it you know, by, by the end, it concluded with um, 800 students being arrested in a sit down um, in, in, in the university administration building. Nothing like that had ever happened on a university campus in the United States before. And then a strike in which the majority of the student body of 20,000 people, most of them, withdrew from classes. Some professors held their classes outside of the campus so to continue. Um, the university community, um, which just a year or two earlier was as conservative as anything was in the late 50s and early 60s, the majority of the student community and much of the professors and most of the graduate students had come around. And eventually the, the faculty told the administration, you've got to the students are right and you're wrong and you've got to give in and they did and we won a great victory um, but it was really about advocacy um, to put it in the context um, a month in earlier not too much earlier the most controversial speaker or one of the most controversial speakers in America at that time Malcolm X spoke on the campus so controversial speech if it was properly um, you know uh, organized and proper, all the approvals were made and so forth could still happen. What they were, what, what they didn't want was students engaged or anybody on the campus engaged in advocacy. That's what the free speech movement is about, and its implications were um, much more than we. It, it affected much more than the Berkeley campus. Jack, do, do you think that the, the country has the same? What, what seemed to be a, a ultimate respect for what we would call in our business petition and assembly, you, you talk about advocacy. Um, does the country have that same respect today? Is it gone forward or gone backward from those years where you won the victory in support of speech and petition and assembly? I mean, in, in the 50s and early 60s, um, people were afraid to sign a petition because they might not be able to get a job. Um, people were Professors were required to sign loyalty oaths if they had not been members of any subversive organizations. If they didn't sign those loyalty oaths, 
um, they were fired. And it turned out the ones who were members of those organizations signed the oaths and the civil libertarians who refused to sign the oaths were the ones who got fired. But civil liberties had very little respect in the late 50s and early 60s. And the free speech movement was really um, a reassertion of traditional rights that had been lost um, in, in, in the Cold War um, atmosphere. Um, and we won it at Berkeley and um, other campuses soon followed suit. They didn't want to tangle with their students in the same way. Um, we um, got a lot of support. Um, only a few months afterwards, as the Vietnam War started heating up, um, the very first um, anti-Vietnam War um, activity, major activity on Berkeley campus, not the first, but the biggest, 25,000 people came out to a, a, a two-day teaching um, on, civil, uh, on, the, on the Vietnam War that was advocating opposition would not have been possible beforehand. Suddenly the whole campus, um, it, 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 made, it set the stage for that. If I read history right, um, during most wars, people who oppose the war go to jail. That happened during almost every war up to that point. Um, the, um, the atmosphere that free speech movement helped create, created space that um, authorities were less anxious, not that they didn't suppress um, anti-war activists, but they were much more careful than they had been before because of an example that that could get out of hand and that could become the problem. I mean, um, the university tried to intervene to stop the students from engaging in the civil rights movement, and then um, suddenly they became the target themselves. So, so, so that's that was basically what happened. It, so it, it had a profound impact, way beyond um, anything that we thought it would happen. I mean, I was pretty narrow-minded. My my worldview didn't go very far beyond the circles in which I traveled, um, but it had a profound national impact um, um, that we couldn't have imagined. Well, you traveled in, in, I think by most people's estimations, pretty wide circles in terms of first the civil rights movement traveling through the South, as I understand it, the, the voter, voting rights effort back to Berkeley, the free speech movement. Fast forward to today, um, we have Black Lives Matter on one side and, and obviously the protests around any number of the killings of, of black men by uh, police. But we also have on the other side of uh, the anti-COVID-19 restriction uh, demonstrations. You know, I, I think we can make the point that Americans take to the street when they, they want the government to hear them. How do you evaluate those movements in terms of your legacy? I mean, with, you know, again, I, I, you hear them make references at times to the free speech movement in, in the 60s. Are they an outgrowth of the kind of activism and, and advocacy that you helped start? Well, I mean, I, I, always, I always chuckle um, when I hear all kinds of politicians, including conservative politicians talking about how this is what America is all about. Because um, when I started out, um, advocacy, petitioning, protesting. I mean, when I w walked on civil rights picket lines before the free speech movement, people spit at me and called me names. It, it was not. Um, and you were called a communist uh, for just walking nonviolently uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, you know, supporting, um, you know, a fair house fair housing or fair employment opportunities. Those were years different. after the McCarthy period. I mean, we're, we're just a decade uh, from the McCarthy period. Yeah, I mean, the early 60s was still part of the 50s. And so, and, and, and so people were afraid. I mean, it was young people who hadn't gone through that, who couldn't understand why people were afraid. Um, you know, and, and it wasn't like today where you go so in debt when you go to college that you got to worry about that job. You know, we didn't have to pay much for college, if at all. You can, you know, college was based, you get a great education basically free. And so we weren't worried about um, our futures and our job prospects and the way our earlier people who'd been through repression, been through the depression were, and, and we did it. But, but so in that period, the right to protest, the right to petition, was not considered the American way. That was considered subversive and dangerous. That's why they try to stop it. Um, today, today everybody 
Um, you know, today protest is, is part of America in a way it wasn't then. Um, and that's got good and bad, um, good and bad aspects. I mean, on the one hand, um, sometimes, you know, for me, throughout my whole career as an activist, which, I, which I've been up to the present, everything you do, you, you engage in a protest or you petition or what, that's a tool to achieve an outcome. And you have to see the relationship between the thing you're doing and the outcome you're trying to achieve. Um, sometimes you get into cultures where signing a petition is just the way you express yourself or joining a protest is the way you express yourself. Um, and the whole notion of how that relates to the objective that you ostensibly are trying to achieve gets lost. And so, so that's one thing that, that I would say is if you're going to use these rights, um, use them for a purpose and understand um, what are the tactics and what are the strategies and how what you're doing um, actually can contribute to what you're trying to achieve. In terms of the people who are protesting masks, um, we didn't protest with guns. And many of the many of the people um, were using the masks as a excuse to be able to sort of surface and recruit for these um, militia type movements, which are incipient um, efforts to say the government is illegitimate and we need to be armed to be able to protect ourselves from this overarching government. Um, I, I was very much, um, and still am, a proponent of nonviolence in, 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 when you're involved in protests and demonstrations. And there was in the 60s a big debate, is this a, uh, is this a philosophy? Is this a tactic? Right. And there were those who said it's just a tactic. And those who said, no, it's a philosophy you can never. And I've reflected on that a lot. And I've concluded it was neither a philosophy nor a tactic. It was a strategy. It was more than a tactic. It wasn't just you do it when it's useful. It was a whole notion, it was a whole strategic idea about how you achieve change in society in ways where you don't create ruptures that are more troublesome than the problem you're trying to solve or create new problems that make the problem you're trying to solve worse or invite violence against you by forces much greater than you. So it's not just a so it's a strategy of how you bring about how how ordinary people um, can mobilize themselves and bring about change in society. And I, I find um, the um, preoccupation with weapons, um, with, um, with 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 violence for the sake of violence, and I even saw that in the later '60s sure. in, in in the Bay Area, where I started meeting people who moved to Berkeley not because, uh, because it was a center of protest, not because they believed in the causes we were protesting, but they really um, had a hunger to join in protests that they thought might turn violent. They wanted to fight in the streets. And it didn't matter to them that much, whether it was for a left-wing cause or a right-wing cause or a good cause or a bad cause. It was the excitement uh, of, uh, of the fight that attracted them. And so, um, so, so the nonviolent thing, um, not, not as a tactic and not as, it's not a philosophy of life. It's not that I believe all wars necessarily are bad per se. Not that I believe that you don't have a right to defend your family. Um, but when you're engaged in public action um, in, a, in a society that has at least some semblance uh, of rights, um, then you, you engage in a nonviolent way is, I believe, the most effective strategy to follow to actually achieve the goals you want to achieve and not create problems that are worse than what you anticipated. Jack, let me ask you a, a question about, a, a, you touched on the future of speech and the c current and future of speech. Let me ask you a, a question about students today. You know, in our polling, which we do, and in the uh, movements around uh, a lot of student activism or, or voices on campus today, a lot of polling shows that students want to be protected as much from hearing something they don't like as being able to speak. And it's become sort of a shield, as they say, instead of a sword uh, to advance a cause. It, do you have a sense of that? Do you, you're obviously still an activist. And 
can you understand that emotion where people want trigger warnings, where they, they want to have safe spaces? That seems to be a characteristic of, of a number of students today anyway. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I've, um, I'm pretty far distant from students today. I'm 80 years old. <laughs> uh, and, and my activism for the last 25 years has been mainly with organizations in uh, Africa and Asia, Latin America, former Soviet Union, you know, people in countries um, where they're really struggling for, for basic rights. And so, I don't, I, so I, I don't feel I have a lot of expertise on what students think today. I do think though that um, th there are some difficult lines um, to be drawn. Um, I, I, I remember traveling um, on the West Coast right about the time that um, there were some, um, I forgot his name now, but one, one of those right-wing provocateurs that was, was setting up a, to speak on campus for the sole purpose of being stopped. Yeah. And, and, and and so that the, there are there are certainly uh, there are certainly a whole effort not by people who believe in free speech not by people who defend free speech in my in my day the, the, the it was the conservatives it was the it was the editor of the Oakland Tribune who was the um the the, the chairman of the California Republican Party and the, the the head of the Goldwater campaign in California who was the one who pushed the university to crack down on the civil rights movement. So in my day, it was definitely the conservatives who were the main enemy of free speech. Now conservatives wrap themselves in free speech. And frankly, I believe it's just a tactic. I think maybe some of them, maybe some of them believe in free speech, but I think a lot of them use it as, as a sword and as a weapon um, with any, without any belief that they would actually defend it if, it was in, if, if, if they could suppress it to their, to their advantage. The other thing that's, I think, tricky is that um, there is speech can be um, a, a, a way of harm. You can use speech to harm somebody. I can start, I can just stand here and start calling your mother all kinds of vile names to get a reaction from you. Um, and if you react, then you're the one who's interfering with my free speech. Or I can advocate things that are going to cause violence. I can advocate. Um, for white supremacy, I, I can advocate for Ku Klux Klanism. I can do, I can be do things that are going beyond um, protected speech in my mind, and much more in, in, in the line of um, not quite yelling fire in a movie theater, but it can be more, more like um, um, pro, uh, provoke, provoking, pro, provoking activities that that are not. Um, so these are, I don't want to say, I don't know where you draw these lines, but, um, but, but for young people who've grown up in a world where free speech has largely been protected and who see some of these vile activities being done in the name of free speech, it, 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 it undermines um, respect for free speech. Um, take it away from them and you'll see how quickly they'll change. Well, we've, we're nearing the end of our time, but I, I did want to ask you just a week or so ago in a TV interview, I was hearing a young protester being interviewed and talking about the current administration saying that uh, one of the criticisms was just a bunch of old men and women. And uh, as, as she put it, the old saying goes, never trust anybody over 30. You know something about that phrase. And uh, did she quote you accurately from those days in the early 1960s? Well, I, I was giving an interview to a reporter right after, right actually during the free speech movement. And this reporter uh, was sort of baiting me uh, and we were getting really horrible press. We were called, you know, we were called subversives and communists and um, terrible people in the press. And this reporter was baiting me and was trying, who's behind this thing? What's really going on? Who's Basically, I thought he was saying, maybe I misunderstood him. Who's pulling your strings? And, and, and I thought he, you know, and, and I said, you know, we have a saying in the movement, we don't trust anybody over 30. And then that through media of different reporters picking that up, it, it became a thing. There wasn't a saying. I just pulled it out of my head that way. But um, I do think it has validity in the sense that um, I was saying, that we created this movement. There weren't some old people pulling our strings or some subversive pulling our strings. We were something else behind what we were doing. This was us. We were doing it for ourselves. And it, and, and I was saying, and I would say today to young people, 
young people need their own movements. They need to control their own movements. They need, they need to have their own autonomy. Um, there are things that people who my age and your age, who've been through so many, so much pain and suffering and have so many scars, um, fresh, a fresh approach, um, people are willing to take risks, people are willing to make mistakes. That's what's needed. And so I think young people do need to have their own movements. And I think not that we didn't um, take, talk to people who were older than us and take their good advice, but it was their advice to us and we chose what to take and what not to take. And it was our movement. And I think um, that was its strength. Um, it was a real, it, it, it had its own integrity. Jack, thanks for being with us today. I, I have to tell you that I, in my view, uh, I think you're the sort of engaged citizen that the founders had in mind when they created the First Amendment, which, uh, which as you point out, has a purpose of solving problems and, and tackling social ills, not just to allow us to uh, fire off an insult or, or you know, uh, just burp, as uh, Homer Simpson once said, uh, the First Amendment doesn't protect the right to burp. Uh, so thank you very much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. A special note to our donors, uh, we hope you can join us on Tuesday, October 27th at 6 p.m. for our next evening with the curator. We'll take you on a virtual tour of Women Win the Vote, an exhibit currently on display at the Ronald Reagan National Airport and Dulles National Airport, marking the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which of course gave women the right to vote. To learn more about how to attend and support our work, contact the development team at development at freedomforum.org. Thanks again for joining us. I'm Gene Polosinski. Our guest has been Jack Weinberg, one of the founders of the free speech movement and a lifelong activist.